to share some research that I've done on media coverage of philanthropy. And I'm going to speak for about 20, 25 minutes. And then my colleague, Kaylee Flaxman, who's also been looking at media coverage of philanthropy, but in a different study. So we thought, well, let's put them together and give you two for the price of one. Uh, is going to do a couple of slides at the end. And then hopefully we'll have time for uh, a discussion. So that's how we thought we'd, we'd run it. Um, I'm based normally at the Canterbury campus, uh, but I was actually here in July. Uh, for the congregations that were held in Rochester Cathedral. And I just wondered if anybody here either graduated uh, in July um, or was there in another capacity, you know, as a member of staff and what have you, yeah. So anyone remember this lady getting her honorary, uh, honorary degree um, at that ceremony on July the 14th, I think it was. Well, this is Sigrid Rousing, and she is an example of somebody who is not male and not dead and not a local giver. Uh, and if you remember, the title of the talk is why, in my opinion, the media tends to favour those, kind of, those kind of donors. Um, Sigrid was given an honorary degree by the University of Kent for a number of reasons. She's uh, accomplished in many fields, but one of them is in philanthropy. And so far, she's donated around about £250 million pounds to, mostly to human rights charities. And in the UK context, context that's pretty significant we don't tend to have the sort of philanthropist you get in the US so once you start getting into seven figures that's quite significant by UK standards so so she was given this honorary degree and my job was to steward her and that's a job that uh, colleagues get if they know something about the topic that the person who's being honored uh, is there for and I just had to look after her and make sure she was in the right place at the right time and that she you know enjoyed her day really so we had loads of time to talk because we had lunch together and so on and during that day, she told me a story which, which really is, is relevant to, uh, to our, our topic today. So Sigrid is not, a, not an anonymous donor. She's not a secretive donor. She has her name on her foundation. You know, people know she's a philanthropist. But nor is she someone who kind of really courts the limelight. She doesn't do endless interviews and profiles and kind of, you know, put herself about. She doesn't stick a name over everything that she funds, you know, the way some, some donors do. So she's sort of somewhere in the middle between private and, and public. Um, her family, the Rousing family, are a Swedish family who invented Tetra Pak. So anyone who's ever opened a carton of milk or a carton of juice, you know when you kind of squeeze it and press it and then it makes that little pouring spout? That's what this family invented and it's made them billions, apparently. It's uh, you know, very, very good to uh, invent things. So that's what they do. Um, so they are you know, a, a high-profile family. And for, very sadly, in 2012, they hit the headlines for reasons not to do with business and not to do with philanthropy. Uh, her brother, Hans Rousing, had a, a, a sort of personal tragedy. He's a drug addict. She's spoken about that before. And his wife died, also a drug addict, wife died of a drug overdose. And because the two of them were in such a, you know, a, a messy place, um, her body was left in the house. He concealed it under piles of rubbish for an unidentified length of time until it was discovered by the police. And he was convicted uh, of preventing unlawful burials. So the family were in the headlines, and of course, the fact that the family's super wealthy and all the rest of it means that this gets a lot of attention. So you can imagine that they had had enough of journalists in 2012. You know, they'd, they'd been in the news a lot for all the wrong reasons. So it comes to 2014, and she meets a journalist from The Guardian. Um, and of course, she supports human rights charity. She's kind of a Guardian sort of person. And this journalist at The Guardian convinced her that now was the time for her to kind of emerge from that maybe period of stepping back a bit and talk about the work of her foundation. And this journalist said, you know, it's time that you told the world all about the wonderful work your foundation's doing and let's do a piece on you. So she agreed to do it. And it appeared as the front cover story in the Saturday magazine. Some of you might remember it. Um, and guess what they led on? Did they lead on her foundation and her philanthropy and all the good work it did? No, of course not. They dug up the, the salacious details of the family tragedy. Uh, and the headline of the piece that was in the paper that day was, the sadness was overwhelming. You know, that's not what she was there to talk about. So that, that trick, for want of a better word, of using philanthropy as a hook to get people in to then basically talk about gossip or other non-philanthropic related stories is something that Kaylee and I have found time and again when we studied media coverage of philanthropy and it seemed to me uh, that that was a, a, an interesting Medway related recent example. Now lots of newspapers do it but The Guardian has got a particularly bad track record of doing it. So let me share with you Bill Gates's story now. don't need to tell you who he is um, but what people are maybe not as aware of is that not only has he given the most amount of money of any uh, donor, more than if you add at Rockefeller, Carnegie, and all these sort of uh, golden age greats together. So far, he's given over $30 billion. 
But also, at the age of 52, he stepped down from running Microsoft. He's quite young, 52, really. He had at least another 10 or more years in him of running a company. But he stepped down at the age of 52 to run the foundation full time. So that meant he was giving pretty much all his money and all his time to philanthropy. So what did The Guardian make of this? They said, well, Bill Gates is giving millions, actually billions, to charity. Why not? What else could he possibly do with all his money except coat himself in treacle and roll in banknotes? Nice. So it's that sort of snidey, kind of poking fun, um, really rather cynical approach that, that characterizes uh, the, the kind of coverage that I want to, to talk about. Um, more recently, last month, Priscilla Chan and Mark Zuckerberg, I'm sure you all noticed this story, uh, gave $3 billion for the rather ambitious goal uh, to cure, manage, or eradicate all diseases. Now, quite rightly, there was a debate in various newspapers about how realistic that goal was. Is that sum of money even enough? Um, but there was also, yet again, in the UK media, this undertone of who do you think you are? You know, what's this all about? And the independence coverage said, is anyone else left underwhelmed by the unbearable arrogance of Mark Zuckerberg? And you do just think, what do you actually have to do to get them to say something nice about you? So I decided to study, for all these reasons, decided to study media representations of philanthropy just to explore what are these assumptions that underlie um, UK media coverage. And, you know, was I just noticing the exceptions or were these the norm? And, you know, what was going on? Um, and there's just a few quotes there for those of you who can see from where you are, just to sort of spell out the kind of thing. Philanthropy attracts a bored and underqualified and hypocrites with more money than sense. You know, this is the kind of stuff I kept seeing. And I just wanted to see, uh, you know, really, was it, uh, was it typical or not? Um, as you know, whenever you start a piece of research, the first thing you do is look and see who else has already studied in this field so you can make sure that you can make a, a useful uh, addition to the knowledge. And there were four studies that I just very briefly want to, to tell you about. Um, only one of them specifically about philanthropy. Mostly people had looked at media coverage of charity in the wider sense rather than philanthropy, which is essentially a funding mechanism uh, for, for charity. So this is actually just a few quotes about people saying why media coverage matters. And again, in a room like this, I'm sure you know. You know, the media doesn't just report, on, report what happens. It, it reflects reality. It creates um, our, our understanding of things. So these couple of quotes uh, spell out that sense in which the media kind of validate and, and create consensus amongst us about how things are. So here's the, the uh, previous research that I wanted to mention. So first, Natalie Fenton at Goldsmiths, who I'm assuming is somebody, if I've heard of her, I'm sure you've, you've heard of her. Um, her study um, found that it really depended uh, on the type of newspaper, so broadsheets and, and tabloids having uh, different approaches. But either way, uh, they tended to focus on what charities do uh, rather than the values that they, that they promote. Uh, the Deacon uh, and colleague study uh, is uh, probably mo the sort of most substantial of the four. Uh, and again, he confirmed this finding that the focus is on deeds over thoughts and also found that different kinds of charities, you know, the more kind of media-friendly cancer kids and kittens, tend to get a bit more uh, favourable coverage. And he came up with what I think is a rather nice phrase to summarise media treatment of, of a charity. He says it's a combination of indulgence and neglect. So it's sort of favourable, it's there, yet it's quite superficial. Um, Matt Hale's study, uh, which is looking actually at philanthropy in America, um, also found that really the coverage is rather shallow. You know, they get through the first first level, sort of, uh, you know, they're, they're in the door, they're, they're there in the papers, but really it's pretty um, uh, pretty shallow and pretty episodic rather than showing, you know, what these stories actually add up to in total. And then Theresa Lloyd's work is looking at philanthropists in the UK, uh, and she found not only does, is media coverage a bit skewed in terms of sort of um, really being a bit of a veiled attack on, on the possession of wealth rather than what they do with it. But also she found that a lot of her interviewees who themselves were wealthy donors were, were quite, you know, scared of, of the media and what they, what they might say about them were they to do something good. And Teresa and I wrote a book together a couple of years ago revisiting some of her work. And these quotes are from both the first study and then the study I did with her, giving that donor view on what it's like to be written about. So they said things like, I'm afraid of the media, it's always negative, they've got great power and there's no right of reply. Um, journalists uh, decry de giving, they enjoy digging the dirt and the press can be very hurtful. Um, why are the media nasty? They don't do good news, they're snide, they pander to jealousy. The obituaries of philanthropists are nice, but during their lifetime journalists dig and there's nothing to be done. So you, you get the idea, a real sense of kind of fatalism that no matter how much we give away or what good we do, uh, we're never going to get any good press for it. 
So this is what I was trying to, to grapple with in my study. Uh, my research question was, well, to what extent does the UK media cover philanthropy and how, how do they cover it? Um, I did a secondary data analysis. I don't know, um, I'm quite, again, I'm sure in this room you're very familiar with LexisNexis or Nexus as I think it's now called. Uh, and this is a few years old. Ben and I have been talking for a few years about me coming, so apologies for the fact that it's a few years old. But the, the, uh, the data set is all from 2006. Uh, and what I did was um, isolate all the articles which had a major mention of philanthropy in that year, in those 12 months. And that led to 626 articles. However, there was a racehorse called Philanthropist that year, so I had to take out all the stories to do with him. There was also a play on in London about the philanthropist, so I had to take them out. And that's what we call cleaning the data. And once I'd taken out all those you know, wrongly uh, identified pieces, I was left with 418 articles, which was collectively was 500 pages of text and over 300,000 words. So it was still a good size data set to play with. And I'm just going to talk you through the analysis that I did uh, of that data. So first of all, um, I found that philanthropy is of interest. 418 articles, that's more than one a day. So really reflecting what Deacon said, it, it's there, it's, it's, you know, it, it makes it through the gate, it's, it's on the UK media radar in a kind of drip drip uh, way. But that interest is primarily in the broadsheets, as you can see from the top table there. So just over half, 51% of the coverage uh, was in the broadsheets. And then the regional papers tend to be pretty interested in this stuff, but really it's of quite minimal interest to the tabloids. And I'll say something a, a few slides on about that local interest, but just to give you a taste of it, this is a, the Liverpool local paper talking about the strong tradition of philanthropy in that in that city and they named the Tates and the Rathbones and the Williamson and, and William Lever, you know, people who are Liverpool, have Liverpool connections uh, and the sense that in Liverpool this is what we do. So the way that regional papers try to build up that sense of identity and use charity and philanthropy to achieve that. Uh, then I looked at, well, which part of the paper does it appear in? And if you look at the top line, the news section, it was less than half, only 43% of the articles about philanthropy uh, were, were news stories. So more than half were outside of the news section. So it's slightly more likely to appear in what I suppose in the old days we might call the, sort of the society section. You know, it's the gossip, the features, the obituaries, the letters, that, that side of things, rather than sort of the hard news. Um, then I looked at, well, you know, never mind just numbers of how many articles. How long are they? Are they tiny? Are they, you know, pages long? And overall, you can see, all, you know, four out of five, 81%, are less than a thousand words. Um, less than a thousand is still a big range, so I broke that down in the table below uh, in hundred word blocks. And you can see that the median and the mode were somewhere between 300 and 500 words. So they're short. You know, in 300 to 500 words, you haven't got space to do much more than give a hook, uh, give the bare bones of the story. You can't develop, uh, you can't develop this, you know, the story or explain what's happening or link it to other kind of societal uh, stories. So again, the idea of indulgence, but really uh, neglect. And most of the coverage is about a single philanthropist, uh, which is what the top table shows. So 61% is about one philanthropist. There's much less where they're talking about philanthropy in general as an activity or you know, groups of philanthropists trying to achieve things together. And one of the more sort of striking findings of this study was that within that 61% of uh, pieces that are about one philanthropist, a third of the time, 32%, they're only talking about six men. The same names come up again and again. Tom Hunter was a Scottish, the, Scotland's first homegrown billionaire. He made his money uh, in uh, sports uh, manufacturing. A very interesting, charismatic, definitely someone who, who um, uh, is, is very out there and willing to talk about his philanthropy. But 10% of all stories were about him. And then five other men, including Andrew Carnegie, who's obviously long dead. Um, so you're not really getting a representative uh, sample of, of philanthropists. It's the same names again and again coming up. The next stage of my study was to do what we call effective framing. And that essentially means how positive or negative uh, is, the, is the text about the philanthropist. And the way you do that is you code each article, all 418 of them, on a Likert scale. I did a five-point Likert. You can do seven as well. From very favorable, favorable, neutral, unfavorable, very unfavorable. Uh, and then you need to usually ask a colleague to sort of check in on a sample or even more than one colleague to make sure that they agree with how you code uh, each of the pieces. 
So despite my, I suppose, my hunch going into it, my hypothesis, if I wanted to be a bit more grandiose, um, and, and despite the views of those donors that I shared earlier, in fact, you can see that the majority, if you add up 17 and 43% together, the majority, uh, over 60%, is actually quite favourable. Uh, then a good chunk, a quarter is neutral, and it's only 14% of stories that I coded, that we, we coded as, uh, as uh, unfavourable to any degree. So perhaps there's no problem, you know, it's only one in seven, uh, you know, that's not bad odds, is it? But of course, if you've done something good, you, you might think you should always have something nice uh, said about you, although I'm, I, it's a story for another seminar, but philanthropy is not always unequivocally good, there can be a dark side and so on. But let's just stick with the idea that philanthropy is at least intended to, to make a useful contribution to society. So you could say that really, you know, it's not fair even to have a one in seven chance of being shot down. Uh, and certainly, I think we can all agree that in our personal lives, you remember insults more than you remember compliments. So even if uh, six out of seven are saying nice things, it's that one when they say something rough about you that you remember and reverberates uh, in your ear. Um, I also I, uh, looked at how that related to the kind of uh, newspaper it was in. Uh, and local papers, uh, the regional papers, were the most likely to, to give favourable uh, coverage. Again, relating to that point made earlier, and, and just to, you know, to expand on that, this idea that local media do really like to champion their local donors. So again, a piece of work by Natalie Fenton, who talks about the local press, um, uh, used examples of good citizenship uh, as a way of kind of bringing together the, the geographic area that their newspaper serves. Uh, and again, David Deacon talking about voluntary activity being very highly valued in its own right. A reliable column filler for a quiet news day, a little charity story with a big giant check and so on, uh, but also as a useful means for locating and localizing a paper within its target region. So there's sort of good business reasons, I suppose, why local papers are more positive about philanthropy. Um, I then looked at whether... Um, um, Sorry, this is the, uh, the focus of the story. I then looked at, uh, if you correlated, you've cross-tabbed basically, whether they're only talking about one philanthropist or many and how favourable the treatment was. And what I found was when they're only talking about one, they were more likely to be positive. And I suppose that makes sense because it gets a bit personal if you're doing a profile of one person and then a particularly negative. It's easier to, to sort of slate a large group of people. Um, so that was that finding. Okay, moving on to the cognitive framing, and that essentially means um, how the substantive attributes of the story um, are influencing the, the topic under discussion, you know, how, it, how it's talked about. So first of all, I began by looking at, well, is, the, is philanthropy the object, the kind of the main focus of the story, more than 50% of the article, or is it just the subject? Is it a sort of one of the attributes amongst many other attributes? And as you can see, it's a more likely to be a sort of passing reference or a less less than the main focus of the story. Uh, and again, uh, looking at those in relation to what they, the story is actually about, there's a lot of profiles of philanthropists, so I added that in as well as the do, what people do and what they think. And again, there's this real focus on what they do, not what values they're trying to express, what change they're trying to make, what kind of society they think we should have. It's very much about, uh, about the, sort of the cold hard facts of what they're doing. Um, then I looked at uh, whether or not it was treated in an episodic way. You know, do we understand this to be an, uh, an unfolding story? You know, there's always been philanthropy historically. Uh, it's been part of our society. It's been in the mix with government and the market. Or is it seen much more as, oh, this happened, and then that happened? Um, and, um, and as you can see from the findings, they're more likely to, to see it in this very isolated way, not to understand the kind of full sweep of the way that philanthropy plays out in our society. Uh, and I broke that down by type of newspaper uh, as well. This is quite a fun part. Um, I looked at all the adjectives that were used in the coverage. Um, again, just trying to see whether there was any truth in the, the sense that donors had that they were always being um, sort of, uh, you know, treated rather unfairly by, by the, the, uh, the journalists who wrote about them. So I picked out all the adjectives that appeared in this, this big data set, and there were 123 of them used to qualify the word philanthropist. And in keeping what I, with what I was saying a few moments ago, actually, for the most part, they're either neutral or positive. So 55% of the time, it was just descriptive. So a Scottish philanthropist, or a footballing philanthropist, or a Catholic philanthropist, you know, there's no, uh, there's no uh, intention either way there. The next biggest chunk was positive, you know, uh, uh, celebrated, a renowned, uh, an astute philanthropist. 
And again, 15%, which is not far off the 14% of the articles that were unfavorable. In 15% of the cases, they were quite negative. So a Dickensian philanthropist or a disgraced philanthropist or one of the media's favorite, a tax ruse uh, philanthropist. I once showed this to a room full of million pound donors, actually, and they were all kind of with me until this point. And then one said he didn't know why philandering was in the negative column, didn't see why that had to be. <laughs> and I thought, I'm just not going to go there. So, <laughs> so again, you know, you might look at this and think, well, the odds are not that bad, you know, 15% being negative. But again, I would say, you know, if you've chosen to spend a few million on the public good rather than on a yacht, uh, you might think that your chances of, of character assassination are still a, a little bit too high. Um, finally, I want to share the findings of the content analysis that I conducted uh, on the data set, uh, set. This slide summarizes what I found, and some of it reiterates points made before, um, and some of it will takes us on to what I'm going to talk about next. Um, but on that first point, this idea that the media focus is really on their, their wealth and their celebrity and their fame more than on their, the, the money they've given away is this sort of hook for gossip. And just to give you a flavor of what I mean by that, this is a few quotes from various newspapers across the year about uh, different philanthropic activities. So they were talking about um, a, a sort of a charity gala event, and it says Bill Clinton will be there, so will the size zero supermodel Lily Cole, ballet dancer Darcy Bustle, Michael Douglas, Catherine Cedar Jones, and even the artist formerly known as Cat Stevens. It could well turn out to be Britain's celebrity dinner of the year. There's just no mention of philanthropy or charity. In fact, it was an ARC event, and they were raised, I think, 26 million pounds for. Uh, for various projects with kids. Uh, but nothing about that is about the size of the guests and how famous they are. Um, you know, champagne will be guzzled by the bucket load for London's A-list, more like an Oscars party than a charity event, uh, and so on. So you know, this, that's the kind of uh, typical sort of uh, coverage that's really masquerading as an article about philanthropy, and it's just, just gossip. Um, I want to get on to uh, the point about gender, because I... I uh, in my title, I said I think they, they treat men and women differently. There were 119 philanthropists named in that one year of coverage that I looked at. Uh, and of them, 21 of them, that's 18%, were female, of whom six lived in the Victorian era. So only 15 contemporary philanthropists attracted media attention uh, during that year. And even when they were talked about, the coverage was just different. And the coverage of female donors was about their looks, their private lives, their personal connections, whereas when they talked about male donors, it was you know, the size and source of their wealth, their business dealing, and their political connections. Now, this is normative. This is what happens to women and men in daily life, but it also happens in, in philanthropy. So just to give you a, a flavor, here's three of the male donors who were, who, and still are, uh, uh, talked about in the media. So Irvin Laidlaw, this is what the press said about him. He founded the world's largest events and conference company. He now has more time and money to donate to politics, philanthropy, and his passion for fast cars and boats. And then we've got Robert Edmiston, who that year was uh, number one on the, the giving list, given the most away. Last year, this Birmingham-based car importer gave almost £44 million, more than 10% of his wealth, to Christian charities, making him Britain's most generous philanthropist. And then over here on the right, we've got John Studzinski. And he's described as a devout Catholic with a chapel in his Chelsea home who finds time at weekends to work in soup kitchens and shelters for the homeless. He's one of the best connected deal makers in the city of London to the point that there are rumors he has the Pope's mobile phone number programmed into his phone. So, you know, they're powerful, they're well connected, they're big, you know, they, these are big characters to be taken seriously. Now let's look at how they talk about female donors. So we've got, uh, from the left, Louise Bluin McBain. This is how they describe her. The mysterious arts doyen, best known as a £260 million pound blonde divorcee who once dated Prince Andrew. Good to know. Uh, then we have in the middle at the top Anne Gloag. Uh, actually, she's one of the people who uh, bought Stagecoach uh, and, and made a fortune in Scotland through that uh, industry. But that's not what they care about. She's a Perth-born former nurse who is diminutive, demanding, and a driven billionaire. Good to know she's short. That's useful. Uh, then we have Renu Mehta on the far right, a reformed socialite and former model. Queen Noor, a fabled beauty, a king's widow. And Brooke Astor, doyen of the silk stocking district. So you get the idea. Um, male donors don't just get more, they get more favorable, more serious uh, coverage. And I said before that in general, the media are, are more positive about philanthropy than perhaps I or my donor uh, interviewees had predicted. But actually, that positive coverage for female donors does depend to some degree on what they support. 
So what I found was that those who supported suitably girly causes, like the ballet or children's causes or breast cancer and so on, got more and more positive coverage than women who took on you know, harder and more masculine topics like economic development and, and human rights. So the final finding that I want to talk about is dead donors. Uh, again, just to you know, live up to the, the title of the talk. There were 100 named 119 named philanthropists in the database, as I've mentioned. 20 of them are long dead. So the Andrew Carnegie's, Octavia Hill, who set up the National Trust, uh, Sir William Burrell of the Art Gallery, you know, really historical figures, not, not contemporary figures. The recently deceased um, do also receive more favourable coverage, as that donor said earlier, you know, they're nice about you in your obituaries. Um, so the obituaries often highlight philanthropy, even when it's not quite clear what it actually is they did to, to uh, deserve that title. So here's a couple of examples of Charles Janssen and is Isabel Bigley, who had obituaries in kind of big papers, the Telegraph and the Times, but it just says they were a philanthropist, or she was, she was known for her philanthropic work with no detail whatsoever, as if the word is sort of self-explanatory. There were two significant UK-based philanthropists who died during 2006, Paul Van Vlissingen and Simon Sainsbury, people who'd given many millions. And Sainsbury was described as charming and debonair, one of the most generous uh, of his generation in his Telegraph obituary. Now, the Sainsbury family is, is uh, famously philanthropic. There are, at the last count, 18 different, one eight different uh, Sainsbury family foundations, all doing uh, different kinds of uh, giving. And I don't think uh, his living relatives get those kind of words said about them very often. So that's why I argue that media coverage is most fav favourable for local, male and dead donors. And now I'd like to hand over to Kayleigh to share a few findings from her work and then hopefully we can have a bit of a discussion. Okay. Hiya, um, so <laughs> I am the only quant data person in the uh, Coots Media Group Donor Research. Uh, which is an annual report that maps um, the number and the value of million pound uh, plus donations to and from the UK. And uh, it was in its 10 year anniversary in 2017. And I was just thinking about it, and I was 22 when I started this, which was a bit scary. Um, so, individual donors um, play a consistently significant role in the data, comprising 25% of the value in 2014, as you can see on the screen and 24% um, of the value in 2015, which was 431 million of a total value of 1.83 billion. Uh, within the uh, individual category for the uh, million pound donor research, there were 34 individual males, six individual females, four couples, three families, and then three other anonymous uh, in that category as well. So essentially a lot of my kind of observations, and it's worth noting that these are primarily observation. Um, I have not gone through any sort of systematic research with it because that's not the point of the million pound donor report, but you know, it's something that perhaps I can add in in the future. Um, so yeah, the, my observations of being so immersed in the data uh, really reflect a lot of the things that Beth has already said to you. Uh, so. They tend to be episodic rather than narrative, it tends to be about male, white, aging or dead um, individuals, but this can be um, sort of trumped on some occasions by their, their level of fame. So as you can see up there, I have uh, Louis Tomlinson from uh, One Direction, uh, who gave £2 million reportedly to a charity very recently. Um, for tabloids especially, they tend to be thinly veiled articles about celebrity uh, and celebrity gossip um, and often a good opportunity to criticise them as well. So again, going back to Louis Tomlinson, um, he hosted a gala and invited all of his celebrity friends along to raise money for this particular charity, but it was all about who was there and what they were wearing, etc. and so on, rather than about the charity or how much was raised um, itself. Uh, we've got Lord Laidlaw making an appearance again in this presentation. Um, he donated £1 million to an addiction charity, but most of the media reports and uh, coverage was about his um, own personal life and uh, personal addictions. Um, 
uh, I haven't got his photo up there, but there's Stan Hale as well, who is actually relatively unknown, um, but the, uh, the, the tabloids particularly sort of uh, not ripped into him, but ripped into the charity that uh, he gave the money to. And the donation itself nearly didn't matter at all. It was all about this charity and how they'd misspent the money um, and how terrible and awful they were. And uh, yeah, finally, I just put up um, Peter Moore's up there because he died this year. Um, and uh, so there's lots of very nice obituaries uh, floating around about him at the moment, just to kind of reinforce what Beth said just there. Uh, yeah, so uh, broadsheets will entertain some of this content, but often they will be interested in kind of hedge fund managers and their business profiles. Any kind of philanthropic activity gets added in somewhere towards the end as just a sort of a tag on as if it's almost inconsequential. Local papers, much more favorable um, and much more interested um, in the person, but they, they tend to be favorable to almost to a point of fault, like there's no kind of critique in there at all. It's just about how marvelous the area is and the person is. Um, they do actually include donor opinion and thought, unlike uh, most of the others, but uh, it tends to be the individual specific link to the cause that they're donating to, rather than any uh, broader ideas about philanthropy and philanthropic giving, which relates back to um, what Beth iterated about it being episodic rather than narrative-based. <laughs> But uh, there is there's one thing I wouldn't say that doesn't necessarily contravene um, what Beth has said, but is maybe an aside to that. And that is the idea of the philanthropist next door. This is Sheila Mayer. Um, she's a generous and modest 88-year-old who died of a stroke. She drove an old mini Mayfair and loved to tend her vegetable patch. She was an art teacher in the 60s and 70s. Her father was a builder, and she turned down three marriage proposals to stay at home and look after her ill and aging parents. She made a fortune on the stock market and left one million pounds to each of four charities. She gave throughout her life, always anonymously, and no one had any idea she was so wealthy. So um, there's this whole sort of idea, predominantly within local newspapers, but the tabloids like a bit of this as well. Um, and Sheila Mayer did actually make a couple of um, tabloid press as well, national press. They love this idea and the storytelling that there could be a millionaire right next door to you and you'd never know it because they're so modest and so quaint um, and kind of old as well. Um, <laughs> they, the philanthropist next door does actually tend to be female. They are unmarried or widowed. Um, they are often Scottish. For some reason, they drive terrible cars. They like making a point of that. Um, they have humble beginnings, um, which there was a point in one of Beth's earlier slides, the sort of rags to riches story. Um, especially local newspapers really love that kind of idea as well. Um, quite often sort of secret or hidden wealth. Um, and did I mention widowed uh, or unmarried because they like to reinforce that point a lot about the, uh, the next door donors. And uh, also, they are very often dead. Um, <laughs> uh, a few other examples of this are, um, I can't find any photos of these lovely little old ladies, I'm afraid. But there's Abigail McKillen McCallum, who is very Scottish, um, 90, gave £3 million to Erskine Hospital and £1 million to Cancer Research. Lovely little story that came out in the, the article. She took the train to work. She was a secretary and married her employer. She lived a comfortable lifestyle, but not flashy. Uh, and her last car was a Honda Civic. Then we have Margaret Hollier. She was 95 years old, uh, lived in the West Midlands, just for a change, um, and gave 1.6 million to Good Hope Hospital. She asked her GP about making a donation and he was shocked by the amount. Finally, we have um, Catherine Barr, who was a widow. She was 98, so the oldest of our little group there, and gave 2.6 million to the RNLI uh, for the uh, build of a new vessel on the condition it would be named after her husband. She liked fishing, 
and that's about all that we know because the rest of the article then focused on who her husband was and what he did and how brilliant he was. Uh, Dr. Barr had an MBE um, and uh, yeah, there was no information about her last car but she was Scottish as well. So yeah, essentially um, my findings from the Million Pound Donor Report primarily reiterate um, what Beth has said. But I think certainly, you know, well, this is a kind of, a, sort of addition to what Beth has already said. We can see some of the differences reflected in this when Beth was talking about um, male versus female coverage and uh, what's focused on. Mm -hmm.